the absolute value of the market value of equity. Fundamental is, is basically the, the present value of future cash flows, right? So that means that it's determined by first uh, the future cash flows and second the discount rate, right? So uh, compensable responsibility can improve fair value by reducing the discount rates uh, for several possible reasons. Either shareholders they uh, require a lower rate of return, right, on the investment in the stocks because they think. Uh, high CSR performing firms have lower risk, and therefore they ask for a uh, lower return. This might have to do with you know po uh, future policy uncertainty, where firms are more affected by changes in ESG related government policy, etc. Another possibility is that shareholders may ask for a lower return because they are willing to sacrifice some of the uh, financial return in exchange for the social goods, right? So another possibility is that CSR can affect firm value through affecting the cash flows. Right? So the idea is that if consumers have the preferences to consume socially responsible products, then firms that do well on CSR uh, will also help improve consumer demand and therefore increase the, the revenue and uh, the profitability. Okay. So the challenge here is that um, most of the studies in the literature, uh, they, they examine the relationship between CSR and stock returns, right? And stock returns uh, can be affected by both channels. So it's very hard to distinguish uh, these uh, two different sources of value creations uh, in the empirical setting in general. Okay. So with these uh, challenges in mind, uh, in this paper, we're going to uh, narrow down these big questions Right, and specifically, we ask uh, whether CSR improve firm value by uh, affecting the future cash flow of the firm. Right, so we focus on the cash flow channel, and then we we ask whether that uh, CSR improve firm value by influencing consumer demand. Okay, and to to try to overcome these challenges that I discussed earlier, uh, here we are going to focus uh, on the retail scanner data, which provides granular information. Both in the cross section and in the time series. So, specifically, the, uh, the data that we're examining, the Nielsen uh, retail scanner data, uh, provides uh, weekly product pricing, sales volume, and store location uh, information. Right? So, here we have very rich information on every week how much uh, a company sells a particular product. At a particular store. Okay, so this information is collected from around 30,000 participating grocery, drug, and uh, mass merchandisers, and uh, they cover uh, more than half of the total US drug store sales, 26% of the grocery store sales, and 21% uh, of the, the mass merchandiser sales. Right, so, so that totally provides a, uh, a representative uh, view of uh, how you know, uh, local. Uh, retail consumers uh, respond to the CSR performance of the product manufacturers. So we are going to uh, merge these uh, retail scanner data with the financial information of the, the product manufacturers, right? So, so our sample is going to include the U.S. public firms in the retail product markets. Um, so uh, our specifically our sample. Uh, includes close to 200 US public firms, uh, which sells close to uh, 100,000 different products. Uh, we have all the information at the vertical level. And uh, specifically, the data also provides a very precise definition of what type of products uh, each barcode belongs to. Right? So they have three layers of uh, a definition of a product categorization, so 10 departments, uh, under which you, have, you see 120 product groups. And under which you have uh, uh, four close to 1400 uh, product volumes. Uh, so we have uh, our seven periods from 2008 uh, to 2016. And for the CSR performance, we, we look at a broad range of uh, different measures. Uh, our focus will be on the, the KLP databases, which provides you know, the, uh, information on the strengths and weaknesses. Of each firm's uh, uh, practices on different environmental and social issues. And we are going to focus on five categories of their CSR activities, 
employee relations, uh, community, uh, environment, diversity, and human rights. And we are also going to have like an overall composite score of their CSR performance. And then we also will use the, the reference database, which provides news, uh, mainly the negative news about uh, firms uh, ENS practices. So uh, since I have a little bit of time, uh, hopefully I can provide some more information uh, about the uh, little bit of the technical detail of how we conduct the analysis. So for our baseline analysis, we are going to look at for each firm, their product sales uh, in each county, okay? And then see whether the county level product sales has any correlation with this, the CSR performance of the firm. Okay, so, so in the regression setting, we're going to request uh, firms county level product sales on the CSR performance. And we're going to include a rich set of high dimensional fixed effects to limit the scope of the uh, limited variables. So here's the, uh, the, the results for our uh, baseline analysis. So if you look at the column one, uh, it shows that there is a positive relationship uh, between the CSR rating of the firm, the, the product manufacturers, and uh, the, the county level product sales in the next year. Okay? So specifically to interpret this coefficient in column one, if the CSR rating of the firm goes up by one standard deviation, then the local level uh, dollar uh, revenue uh, of a, a product goes up by 8.8%. Uh, so I think I was missing the, the bottom of the, the, the slides. Okay, and then in column two and three, uh, we look at the sales volume and then the average product price. So here you see there's no correlation between CSR rating and the, the, the average price of the products, but there's a positive relationship between the CSR performance and the sales volume, right? So it seems to be that they can increase uh, product revenue by increasing consumer de uh, uh, demand because they buy a large quantity of the products conditional on the same product price. And so column four and six, I just include some control variables uh, controlling for firm characteristics. So firm size and uh, firm's market value, advertising effort uh, cannot uh, explain uh, this results. Okay, so next we look at the, the subcategory of the CSR rating. So uh, we, we basically, we can see what kind, what aspects of the CSR activities uh, catch more of the attention from the, uh, the consumers. So specifically, we find a significant relationship between CSR rating and uh, uh, product sales for the community uh, uh, engagement ratings, uh, diversity ratings, and human rights rating, right? So these seems to be the topics that consumers care about when it comes to making their consumption decisions. Uh, but uh, uh, other aspects such as uh, environmental issues does not seem to uh, matter as much when it comes to their uh, consumption decisions. So another interesting feature of our uh, analysis uh, of our empirical setting is that we have the local product sales, right? So uh, uh, it, it will provide a lot of very useful information that we cannot learn from the uh, for example, the, the, the revenue figure and the, the uh, earnings per share from the consolidated financial statement, right? Because here we, we see that uh, uh, the, the, the variation of the sales in different counties, so we can relate our findings to the uh, county demographics, which allows us to shed some light of uh, what kind of consumers care more about our social responsibility. Okay, so specifically, we relate our results to uh, some demographic characteristics such as their income, their political leaning, and also their education level, right? So we add the interaction, right, between the uh, CSR performance and the, the local demographic characteristics. And based on our analysis here, it seems to be that uh, the relationship between CSR rating and uh, uh, local model cells is stronger in counties where you see more residents voting for the Democratic Party and also counties that have a high per capita income. Right, so it seems to be that it's the, uh, the, the preference, preference to consume social responsible products has something to do with uh, the, the local consumers' uh, um, income level and also their political view. So next, we try to look at consumer responses at a higher frequency. So here we measure monthly product sales. 
and we link that to monthly releases of uh, negative news about the firm's uh, ENS practices. Right? So, so if uh, consumers actually care about you know, the, the, the CSR performance of the firms when it comes to their consumption decisions, if they hear something bad right, about the firm's ENS practices, they should respond by cutting back uh, their consumption. And we should see uh, a, a lead lag relationship uh, in the time series in the sense that you should see the cutback in the consumption after the news is out of releases rather than the other way around. Okay, so this helps help us uh, pin down the, the direction of the causality. Okay, so here we request the monthly product sales on the monthly releases of news before and after that month. So in the uh, the estimates here, we can see that uh, here we have the news both in the uh, six months before and the three months after the observed monthly quarter sales. And we see that the monthly quarter sales is negatively related to the black news release, but not the lead news release. Right? So this is consistent with a, a causal relationship, meaning that uh, let's say there's some bad news about the firm that are released uh, in January and February, then you see a cutback in the consumer spending on their products in March, right? But you don't see that relationship with the news release in uh, April because at that time in March, consumers do not know uh, about that information, right? So this is consistent with the causal effect of new information about uh, the practice uh, performance of the firm CSR, uh, which affects uh, cons uh, consumers' uh, decision on what products to buy. So lastly, we try to relate uh, consumption, uh, consumers behavior to the attention that they pay to uh, uh, ESG issues, right? So the idea here is we, we are going to utilize uh, some environmental disasters that happen uh, near the, the consumer uh, markets. Uh, so the idea is if there's a tornado that happened in uh, uh, the city uh, very close to you, then you hear about the news then you start uh, thinking more about the environmental issues and maybe be more conscious in your consumption decision uh, and uh, maybe try to uh, buy products that are that you consider as more environment friendly. Okay, so uh, the, the, the important uh, feature of this empirical setting is that this environmental disaster it by itself has nothing to do with the, the perception of the, the firm's uh, policy or the quality of the products, right? It's just that uh, the disasters affect consumers' attention and therefore affect their cons uh, consumption behavior. Right? So we are going to conduct a uh, difference in differences analysis and consider the counties uh, that are having a environmental disaster not directly hitting them but happening nearby uh, as the, the ones that are affected by the effects. And then we look at the consumer market that will be further away from the environmental disaster as the control group, right? So the ones that are located really closer to the events are the ones that have a larger attention shock, right, by this uh, disaster, and therefore they're more affected in terms of their consumer behavior. So this is the, the, the regression setting. So again, we focus on monthly product sales, right? So, to, so in order to look at a more timely consumer response to these events and uh, look at how they behave if there's a a uh, disaster that happened within 500 miles in the past 12 months, how they behave differently from the other consumers. So because we focus on the environmental disaster, right? So naturally you would expect that consumers will pay more attention to the environmental externalities of the products that they are consuming. And this is exactly what we find. So if we look at the column two estimates, you will see that local product sales becomes more sensitive to the environmental ratings of the, uh, the company that manufactures the product after this uh, nearby environmental disasters. And we also find an increase in the sensitivity for the community rating. And our understanding is that maybe they also start, consumers also start thinking about whether the firms have contributed to the recovery of the local communities that are affected by the environmental disasters. Right. So by contrast, we do not see an increased sensitivity of the other aspect of the CSR. So that seems to be consistent with the, what you would expect, right? Consumers to, to change their consumption uh, behaviors in response to environmental disasters. 
But in terms of the timing, we also find something interesting. That is, it seems to be that, uh, seems to be that this attention induced by, by the environmental disasters also have a pretty short life. Right? So the idea is, so what we find in, in our analysis is that this heightened sensitivity of uh, consum uh, consumer spending on uh, uh, in response to the from CSR performance only lasts for three quarters. Right, so what uh, what it means is that when there's a tornado that ha happened in the neighboring county, then you, you start thinking about okay, maybe I should be more uh, uh, concerned about how I spend, how I buy different products that may have different environmental externalities. But after a year, you forget about it, and then you start behaving you know, the, the the same way as before, right? Uh, so this probably just uh, tell us, you know, how uh, uh, the, the, the the horizon of this effect that can be induced by this particular shock that we're studying. But, but I think the, uh, the deeper idea here is that uh, consum consumer behavior also, you know, uh, to a very large extent, are shaped by their awareness of ESG issues. Right. So that could be primed by some ad hoc incidents that might happen that catch their attention. Or it could be driven by some other more long term, uh, long term influences such as education and so on. Right? But uh, here it seems to be con uh, consistent with the idea that environmental disasters only induce a short attention span right? when it comes to you know, affecting consumers' uh, uh, spending decisions. So, uh, overall, what's the key takeaway from our study? Well, we, we think that our, our evidence suggests that overall, uh, consumers do seem to care about operational responsibilities when it comes to their spending uh, decisions. And uh, uh, in particular, we see that you know, the, this, how much consumer care about it depends on their political view and also depends on their income level. Right? So not every consumer is the same. Okay? And also, uh, the response to new information that they learn. Okay? Uh, so, so, so we see the response to the ESG news uh, that are publicized. And also, their response uh, depends on how much attention that they derive to the related issues, right? And uh, overall, uh, it's shaped by their awareness and their concerns about the, the, the ESG issues that are related to the product that they're consuming. So, so these are the, the, uh, uh, the, the insight that we, we thought we could uh, uh, share with you from, from our uh, analysis so far. So, looking forward to the feedback. Thank you very much. And to my knowledge, we don't have Ling Ling, uh, Medin, and Suraj. Uh, Ling Ling is virtual. Oh, there are pictures. Okay, so please go. Uh, so we are we will now um, talking on pricing and producing green products under subsidy regulation. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, could you please uh, make me the host so I can share the screen? If you're ready, you can go ahead and begin your presentation. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, I can share now. So can you still uh, see my slides? Okay, can you see my slides clearly? If that's um, okay. Maybe we can hear you on our end. Yeah, I just can shared. Can you see? Because I see that you are muted. Mm-hmm. Share again. So, can you see my slides right now? Hey, excuse me, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, hello everyone. Thank you for attending this talk. Today, I'm glad to present the research 
um, pricing and producing green products under subsidy determination and competition. This is a co-work with oh Professor Mati and Professor Suresh. So I hope you can see the slides clearly. Sorry, I cannot join in person. Okay, so the main motivation to start this research is the concern about environment and sustainability, which is also one of the uh, important reasons why we gather together in this conference. It is reported that transportation sector attributes to the largest portion of greenhouse gas emissions in United States, around 29% in 2019. Globally, transportation sector also accounts for a large proportion. So we should pursue transportation sustainability. An electric vehicle is recognized as one of the most realistic ways. To mitigate climate change and approach net zero emissions, more than 20 countries all over the world have announced the full phase out of internal combustion engine vehicles over the next 10 to 30 years. The governments also provide several uh, subsidy programs to promote electric vehicles. And it is reported that the government spent a total amount uh, of 40 billion in 2020 to support e-waste. This amount is uh, an out. But we also find in this figure, there is a downward trend for the government spending over the consumer spending, roughly decreasing from 20% uh, in 2015 to 10% in 2020. So following this trend, we can also expect the subsidy will phase out uh, in the near future. Actually, it's a common sense that subsidy will not last forever and will phase out sooner or later. So it's very important to consider the manufacturer's uh, response under the subsidy termination context. And also uh, it's important for the government to design the policy, consider the manufacturer's response. So the example here we said is uh, uh, there is a tax credit in the United States to electric vehicles for customers who purchase it. Uh, and this subsidy will terminate in 2023. Actu actually, before this, there is a sales type of 200,000 electric vehicles for each manufacturer. That means for each manufacturer who sold the electric vehicle of 200,000 uh, quantity, will uh, phase out the subsidy for the manufacturer. So that gives us an opportunity to observe what happened in industry when the subsidy terminate for the manufacturers. Another example is the tax credit for solar panel system. This subsidy will terminate in 2035. So as we say before going to theoretic model, we want to see what happens in industry especially will the manufacturer increase or decrease the price after subsidy termination. And for the opportunity of the sales cap policy, by the end of 2018, Tesla and the general model hates the cap and the subsidy tends to phase out for these two manufacturers. And we actually found in uh, January 2019, Tesla announced it will cut the price after the subsidy terminate. On the contrary, General Moto announced a few months later it will not decrease the price. So this inconsistent clues from industry make our problems even more challenging and, and impactful. Now we formally introduce our research question, which we are interested to analyze the government and the manufacturers' decisions when incorporating the interplay among subsidy termination, learning by doing, and competition. Our research questions are specific in the following. First, what are the optimal prices before and after subsidy termination? And in particular, we care about whether the manufacturer decrease or increase the price over peer roads. We also want to study how should the government terminate the subsidy 
Besides the subsidy amount, research and manufacturer subsidize the all sales uh, policy or the qualified sales rule. So the qualified sales means just means the sale, the sales delivered before the subsidy termination. And then we also want to study the impact of learning by doing in the presence of subsidy, whether it provides something new insight compared to the traditional literature. And uh, we are also curious about the problem under competition when there are two manufacturers. So in order to answer these questions, we uh, model a two-period Stenberger game where the manufacturer is the leader and the, oh sorry, the government is the leader and the manufacturer is the follower. For the time li limit, I will not uh, go to details about the model, but for a brief start, the government first announced the subsidy amount and the termination rule, and then the manufacturer decides the price and production quantity in each period. So this is the optimal solution under qualified sales rule. For qualified sales rule, which just means the uh, government will only subsidize the sales that delivered before subsidy termination. And uh, here we specifically want to know what's the impact of learning rate. As expected, the price in both periods decreased in the learning rate. What does, this mean? what does this mean? This basically means as the learning rate increase, the cost in the second period will decrease. So the manufacturer can price a, a lower in both periods. We would also expect the uh, production quantity in the first period to increase in the learning rate as modeled in the previous literature. However, we find actually the first period production quantity decrease in the learning rate. This is because besides the direct impact of learning rate in the production quantity, there is also indirect impact from the uh, consumer subsidy. As the consumer subsidy will decrease in the learning rate, it drops by the production quantity in the first period. Then we can seminar solve the problem under all sales rule. That means the government will subsidize all the sales in the first period and these sales can be delivered in the second period. So now we try to answer our main research question. First, whether the manufacturer will increase or decrease the price over periods. Based on our results, we find the manufacturer will decrease the price over periods, but will not fully compensate the consumer subsidy. Uh, actually, the manufacturer adopts a sandwich pricing policy, that means the second period price is lower than the first period price, but more than the first period effective price. In this sense, the subsidy will benefit the early adopter for the effective price. And then we want to know whether the government uh, will adopt the qualified sales, sales rule or the or sales rule. So here we find that the government spends less total subsidy expenditure under qualified sales rule. From the perspective of minimizing expenditure, that means the government should implement the qualified sales rule, which means only subsidize the sales delivered before subsidy termination. And this insight actually supported by the US government action, which requires the electric vehicle to be in service in order to qualify for the tax credit. And uh, we also explore this problem under competition, but for the time limit, I will not go to more detail, but just one more insight that shows uh, uh, actually the total adoption of two manufacturers is submodular in the consumer subsidy and competition intensity. Uh, what does this mean? Basically, this means uh, when the uh, total adoption increase in the consumer subsidy, the increase rate uh, decrease, in the compute, uh, decrease in the competition intensity. So basically means when the competition intensity is high, the government is possible to provide a lower consumer subsidy to achieve the same adoption target. In this sense, we say competition is a substitute for the subsidy. So the government can promote uh, competition through the ways of, uh, such as uh, 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 promotes the uh, 
open patent or reduce the patent term to pro promote competition and then in turn provide a lower subsidy. So that's the uh, main results and insights in our paper. Uh, for anyone interested, we're well, happy to take your question at the end. And the paper is also online. So if you are interested, you can look at the paper for details. For summary, uh, we model a Stenberg Nash game to study the problem between the government and the manufacturer. And we uh, obtain the optimal pricing and the uh, consumer subsidy policy as well as the subsidy termination rule. Uh, we also found that the manufacturer prefers the sandwich pricing strategy and uh, uh, the government would like to implement qualified sales rule. We also explore this problem under competition and we have further insights for individual and group learning, which we will not detail in uh, here. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Now we will move to our third presenters, uh, just two from Poland, uh, Justyna Majewska and Szymon Skolaski, and they will present environmental friendly behavior and tourism in Poland following COVID-19, assessment of demand and its determinant using agent-based modeling. Uh, we uh, 
previously observed during this uh, dry environmental training behavior in country estimation as well. But after this COVID pandemic, uh, we can observe a new way of changing uh, the behavior or, or the perception of the situation both from the um, customers or the tourists uh, and also in the tourist fields. And from the methodological um, point of view, we try to determine the possibility of using agent based modeling for this kind of a simulation. So we we think the situation that there is lack of sufficient data on this new uh, phenomenon. Yes, so within this method, um, we create artificial world with um, a virtual agents each of which has its own objective function and all the characteristics uh, like personal demography and susceptibility to external factors and these all features create the um, conditions for this decision making process so the essence of this uh, research is to um, take into consideration uh, the interrelation between the tourists but also between the tourists as the actors in our model and the environment. And how it works, then explain the signing. Okay, fellow. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please? All right. Well, uh, I don't know if I should go very deep into, uh, into the methodology or rather shallow. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, uh, we started our research with, uh, with a survey, uh, a survey of cyclists, we got uh, about 500 respondents, uh, and, then, and we asked them uh, about uh, behavior, uh, about motivation to choose uh, bikes uh, and not other, and not other uh, means of transportation. Uh, do they connect with other cyclists? Uh, are they susceptible to, uh, to, to, to opinions of other, other cyclists and so on? Uh, and uh, based on this, based on this survey, uh, we created uh, a classification uh, using the methodology of prior, hierarchical uh, classification. And the, uh, and the goal of this classification is, as always, to, to make concise groups. That is, uh, to make groups of respondents uh, who are similar within the group and this similar uh, and across uh, across the groups. Uh, you can see uh, okay. uh, you can see the, uh, the classification the classification results here uh, you can see that we uh, arrived at uh, the five final nodes final nodes are uh, final groups uh, and we dubbed these uh, groups as uh, computer cycling cycle tourism and bi uh, bike packers and, and so on I think that the names are quite uh, straightforward uh, maybe apart the you know, the utility cyclists, uh, utility cyclists are people who use bikes to, to do the errands, to go to the shop, to go to visit friends, and, and so on. Uh, the, uh, the numbers in brackets, the brackets are, uh, are the structure uh, of the population surveyed by, uh, by the city. Uh, this, this is the last step of the simulation, not the first, but, uh, but the last. Uh, our simulation um, starts completely randomly. That is, we created 2,000, 2000 uh, virtual respondents to our uh, to our uh, to our survey. Uh, we can we can we can move to the other. Uh, 2,000 uh, artificial um, respondents, and uh, the res each respondent uh, gets random uh, answers to the uh, to the questions of the survey and uh, a place. In the world, in the place of the simulation, uh, we used uh, a model of the world which is called the small world. Uh, this is the most common world uh, used in society, uh, social sciences. Uh, it can be graphically shown as a circle uh, where the nodes are agents, and uh, you can see that each each agent can connect with uh, with their neighbors. These the neighbors, the closest neighbors, uh, represent a group of uh, friends, family, and so on. But from time to time, uh, there is a certain, a certain, uh, certain possibility, certain probability to do it. Uh, agents can can connect with someone they uh, didn't previously uh, previously knew. Uh, 
the connection between between the agent uh, agents means that they they are assigned a role in the interaction. Uh, there are three uh, three types of roles here. Uh, one is that uh, that uh, an, an agent can be yeah three 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 types. Yeah, <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, one uh, one role is uh, to be an influencer. That means that the agent who, who was chosen to be, a, to, to be an influencer imposed their beliefs on other agents, and the other agent role is called influencee. I, I think that the, the such word does not exist, but uh, influencee is a person who was influenced by an influencer. And the third role, the third role is to be inactive and to do nothing to connect with no one. This, uh, this kind of interactions happen 200 times because uh, each simulation is a series of uh, iterations. So we, we have like 2,000, 2000 agents meeting in neighbors, meeting other, uh, other agents like 200 times. Uh, and we wanted to, um, to set the function and or to set the parameters of the, of the, of the function to recreate the um, structure, the final structure of our of our society, like start, which, which started randomly, to represent or to uh, converge uh, to the final uh, final uh, final structure, which uh, which was uh, taken from the from the zoo. Uh, there were. Or there are uh, three times, three types of, of six types of uh, of uh, interaction. It's like peer influence, social learning, role models, and opinion leaders, community engagement, and interpersonal communications. But uh, finally, we group them into three groups. Injunctive. Uh, can I can I get next slide, please? Uh, injunctive means that uh, people behave as they as they believe they are they are supposed to uh, to believe. A descriptive norms means that uh, people try to copy other other people. Uh, they observe other other people, and they uh, they uh, they they start doing the same. And this connects to the nature. Well, <laughs> the name is maybe not, not the best here, but it refers to interesting values. Uh, remember, we were thinking about cyclists. Uh, cyclists are. Mm, a pro environmental community, so so they often behave pro environmental friendly because they feel that they are a part of nature. So this is why uh, we call this uh, this uh, connect us to the nature. Uh, the numbers you can see are the uh, is the importance of uh, of uh, of these uh, kind of interactions. So this connected of the nature is the most important. Following by, by inject, uh, injunctive and then uh, descriptive, that means okay. Uh, that means that uh, uh, intentions to reduce carbon footprint, footprint, uh, are basically not uh, not a case of uh, of something what uh, peers, what other people can impose on us. That means that uh, people can. Think about uh, reducing carbon footprint if they if they want that if they want that if they believe it's uh, it's necessary and if not they don't. Uh, there is a part of there is a part of uh, of people who can uh, who can start behaving uh, pro environmental friendly because of their fears. Uh, well, there is a very very well known case from, from Canada that people started segregated uh, trash because they saw that their neighbors uh, did it. We, but actually, yeah, we didn't find such uh, uh, such uh, such strength uh, of, of, of these uh, of these uh, interactions uh, either. So uh, what it really means is that um, if we want to uh, be as uh, say. Uh, members of society. Uh, if we want uh, uh, to, to impose or to uh, somehow um, make people, maybe not make, but enhance uh, pro environmental behavior, uh, this, this shouldn't be made by, by peers, but other people. Uh, 
showing good examples, uh, but uh, by uh, governmental or regional authorities, uh, maybe some maybe some uh, laws, and uh, uh, they are things which are uh, which are more uh, more connected with create, creating this, this this increasing values of uh, of being uh, for environmental friendly. Let's say at schools uh, or uh, during during the education. But there is a serious weakness of our of our research. And I, I, I need like 50 seconds to say it. Uh, that uh, we this is our first uh, first approach to, uh, to to this to this topic, and uh, we we had to skip uh, with governmental and uh, regional authorities uh, uh, influence. In this, in this, in this, in this research, so this is another new one the, 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 for part of the region, the part of the research. I think close, close. I think this is all from uh, from us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. I will move now to uh, consider response to climate change, wildfire smoke, and sustainable. Product just behind the one that has been presented by Tau. So, this is our last presenter for today. And then, after that, we will move to roundtable discussions, uh, paper discussions. Uh -huh. Um, right, so, right, so um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teo Lin, and I'm a third year marketing PhD student in BT. Right, so today I'm going to present consumer response to climate change, wildfire smoke, and sustainable product choice in Kyoto. Right, so um, climate change has been one of the most important social issues nowadays, and because of the climate change, we have seen that the frequency and intensity of climate change events have been increasing recently. So, uh, for example, if we see the bottom figure, uh, we can see that 15 out of the top 20 most destructive wildfire has occurred up since 2010. So, yes, the wildfire and uh, climate change events have been with us for a long, long time, but it is quite recent that um, yeah, it, it, it received a broad attention from the public. And interestingly, uh, we have seen, we checked that like wildfire smokes can transfer to over a long distance. So the recent literature found that um, the exposure to wildfire smoke can, is it too long? <laughs> uh, the recent literature found that exposure to wildfire smoke can affect the uh, human health condition. And it can also change the uh, human behavior too. However, as far as I, 
I know, and at least in the marketing literature, we, uh, we couldn't find any paper that uh, directly and empirically investigating the uh, investigating how climate change events can affect the consumer's purchasing behavior. So, um, using the 2018 campfire as a focal climate change event in our study, we investigate um, whether wildfire smokes can change consumer purchasing behavior of sustainable products, and if it does, whether uh, they change their behavior gradually or like immediate after exposure. Right. So when we initiated this pro this project, like a lot of people actually asked me, oh, why you use like wildfire smokes, not something else like hurricanes or floods? So um, the reason is because first of all, like unlike the flooding or like hurricanes, wildfire smoke doesn't really affect the supply side, so it's uh, an external dimension. And what I mean here is that um, the floodings and the hurricanes tend to destroy the vast area such that supply chains and stores tend to get uh, destroyed or even like closed temporarily. But um, the stores operations are not really uh, related to the uh, wildfire smokes. So it really helped us to isolate the effect of climate change events on the demand side only. And secondly, the severity of wildfire smokes can be quantified uh, by the particular matter 2.5 data from US EPA. And uh, we find that um, like the multiple studies focusing on the wildfire smokes use this data. And lastly, the dispersion of wildfire smoke is exogenous to uh, consumer purchasing behavior. And this is because where the haze of the smokes land really depends on the fire intensity, the geographical feature, and, uh, and also the meteorological condition at the time of the fire. So this gives us exogenous variation of wildfire smoke level uh, across the multiple counties. So using this variation and the EPA standard that PM level greater than 55 is unhealthy for general population, uh, we define store affected by severe wildfire smoke as the treatment effect and the other store as the control, uh, the control group. Okay, so in this figure, um, I'm sorry, like this figure represents the average PM level around, uh, or I'm uh, sorry, the average PM level of treatments and control group uh, throughout our sample period, which is six months before and after the campfire. So here the vertical dotted, uh, it's not vertical, but dotted line, the vertical dotted line that pre represents the first week of our post period when the multiple counties are affected by the severe wildfire smokes. And the red and green lines indicates the average PM level of treatment and control group respectively. So um, here we can see the trends are actually very similar and the average PM level is always below 25. But at the time of the exposure, we can, uh, we can see that the average PM level of the treatment group suddenly jumps up to 100. And to understand this better, we present the average PM level I'm oh, sorry, the weekly average PM level of each county two weeks before, during, and two weeks after the exposure. And here, the counties without any color are excluded from our sample data because they are affected by the evacuation orders or because we don't have the PM data. So uh, there are several things to mention here. The first of all, uh, even though some areas like San Francisco is really uh, uh, quite a distance from the campfire, but we can see that they are heavily affected by the smoke. And secondly, uh, we can see that the severity of wildfire smokes differ across multiple counties. And lastly, um, sorry, uh, lastly, uh, the air quality comes back to normal after the two weeks. Right, so using this data, we try to estimate the treatment effects through the DID and two-way fixed effects model. So here, uh, the dependent variable is the market share of sustainable digital products. And the third variable indicates the store severely affected by the smoke, the campfire smoke. And lastly, the post variable indicates the time during and after the week of the exposure. 
And before showing the result, here is the, uh, the trend of average market share of two groups. So, um, firstly, we can see that the trend is quite similar, but after the exposure, we can see that uh, average market share for the three months group increased over time, but that, of, that for the control group doesn't really change much. Right, so the estimation result of two models is um, pr presented in column one and two. And we can see that the two months effect is about like 0.073. And these results imply that uh, the exposure to wildfire smoke can lead to increasing market share by 3.7 percentage point. And instead of market share, we try to use the, uh, the sales volume of sustainable and non-sustainable products as the dependent variable. And we find that the effects are positive and significant for the sales volume of sustainable products, but the effects were negative for the non-sustainable products. So these results imply that consumers actually substitute uh, between these two types of products. And we additionally conduct an event study. So here the estimated coefficients represent the difference between two groups relative to the month before the exposure. And here we can see that uh, the coefficient in the pre period are insignificant. So it helped us to um, relieve the parallel trend concern. And after the exposure, we can see that the effects are actually gradually increasing over time. So um, these results imply that um, consumers actually change, change their behavior gradually rather than like immediately. So um, this tells us the one of our smoke is a gentle much. And um, we think this result is because it takes some time for consumers to change their behavior because of the brand loyalty or some stickiness in behavior. In behavior. Right, so in conclusion, um, our, our study is uh, first one directly and empirically investigating how consumers respond to the climate change events. And uh, we have seen that uh, the water smokes can increase the market share and um, then consumers change their behavior gradually. And last, uh, lastly, uh, we have multiple implications. So for example, uh, yeah, like we help us managers to understand how consumers actually respond to the climate change events by using the wildfire smokes. And we further incentivize firms to uh, invest more in sustainable products. All right, so this is the end of the presentation and thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience or from online participants? We have one question. This is just a quick question. Uh, how would you measure sustainable products? What's out there as a, as a measurement? Uh, I, I think that's a really great question, and uh, I actually dropped that detail because the presentation has to be like 10 minutes. So uh, the, how we define the sustainable product. So we choose the diesel products because it has the most number of uh, So sustainable products, we define products with the safer choice certificate, which is um, sustainability certificate by the US EPA. And yeah, and we found, and we also used, uh, we didn't use the digital as the main products because uh, the digital category has the most number of products with the uh, US EPA safer to certificate and has the most issue, uh, most uh, market share. Yeah, so I just in the interest of uh, finding out a little bit more, could you turn the slides back? Could you go backwards? I want to see the chart to the books book of Bellin. And if you look at that one, what would happen? There's no way I can do this. And what would happen if we just started this whole thing right here at point three? Because then 
it doesn't look the same. And your conclusion includes that it takes time, okay? Not gradually rather than immediately. So if, if the chart had started, do you have a pointer? No, I don't have a pointer with me. Yeah. It started at point three. Look at from point three on. Point three, on four, or what? On five, on six. That's a different chart. And that chart doesn't show what your paper shows at all. It, to me, it may be that uh, things change over time and consumer consumers do different ways and because it's not to the wildfires. Um, it doesn't really have to do with wildfires because if you just look at it depends on how you look at the chart. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. All right. Okay. Okay, round table one, uh John, raise your hand. So anybody interested in joining round table one over there? Round table two and three, the chairs are on high, right? So we'll just make it round table two here. Anyone interested in joining round table two here? And the empty table, round table three. Anyone interested in joining round table three? Uh there. Uh that way. Very, very easy, right? Go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for sticking around. Uh, so, round, uh, if you're not interested in round tables, you know, conference is over for today. Uh, do please come back tomorrow. Yeah.
Yeah, 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 there's a snowball. Wait, is that a bike? <laughs> no, no, we're good. I'm not running that I'm the tech guy. I'm like, Thank <laughs> you. 
Correct. I just take that. Yeah, we'll do the same thing. Yeah, look, it's 30. No, no, no. Oh, the long cable it. is yeah. underneath here. Yeah. Oh, we don't need it today. No. We can have a flat session. We can connect the beer. Yeah. Yeah, we could just get rid of it because it's yeah. just route. Yeah, just All right. Okay, you have to go to class after this. Like, you're done. <laughs> 